All right. Well, uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction and uh, thanks everyone for attending. I'm actually uh, really happy and excited to be today and give you more of an overview on how we design and analyze next generation AI systems, not focusing on a specific technology, but aspect, but looking at the entire stack from algorithms all the way down to devices. Okay. Uh, my uh, name let, is me, uh, let me let me ask him. So we have uh, 30 minutes for presentation and 10 minutes for discussions, just a yes. reminder. So I'll, keep it, I'll keep it in time, right? So right. I have Thank you. 30 minutes. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, my name is Mohammed Ali. I mean, um, and actually I'm an NTU uh, assistant professor. I'm also the founder of a spin-off called EMAS, which is short for Embedded AI Systems. All right. So uh, the big picture uh, that we have, right? I mean, like the the use of artificial intelligence, right? It's been like uh, widespread in an unprecedented scale in the last decade, right? And that's actually been like fueled by one particular field, which is called deep learning, right? This actually calls us to build really sophisticated models, do a lot of insights, and could mean and get things with extremely high accuracy. So when doing this, right, since this done at the application front, people found, okay, guess what? Our hardware is not really suited for this. So it sparked another revolution of the next generation of hardware, which is dedicated for deep learning. Now, this is not just an academic research uh, being initiative or like force, but actually the industry picked up so much to the point that actually is becoming a huge demand and there is a projected $73 billion market size at the semiconductor by building dedicated chips for AI and deep learning, whether it is for training or the classification purpose. So what does that do, right? It creates a massive amounts of different designs. Each one of them, as you can see in the slide, be targeting different systems. So from the data centers, right, to servers, to applications, autonomous vehicles, to embedded, right, which is something you can find in your watch, in your smartphone, right, to the extremely ultra low power uh, devices. And each one has its own unique taste, whether you're using digital or analog computation, whether you're using full precision or like bit width. So it seems that like I mean, the AI hardware as a field in itself or the designing of the AI system is no longer about the algorithm, right? It's no longer about the hardware. It's actually becoming a mix of both. And there are a lot of knobs to play there. So, so what is deep learning in general? Deep learning is just like a part, a subset of the machine learning, which is a subset of the field of artificial intelligence. So most of the uh, models that we've seen in deep learning, and I'm pretty sure that uh, many of our uh, audience would know, is that um, is that we're having convolution neural network, we have recurrent neural network, we have a long short-term memory and graph uh, to give an example or to give a few of them. So let me show just a quick uh, introduction or like a quick, let's say recap on what's a convolution neural network, which is one of the most popular in image classification object detection. So when you have this input image here, you perform this what we call convolution pooling and do it fully connected at the end of it, it comes and tells you whether what you have here is a deer or a dog or a cat. But the fundamental uh, operations there, right, is actually to understand how the hardware we design and we need to do something about it. We need to decompose this really, like we say the black box and see what are the building blocks inside it. So we have uh, the convolution operations, this mainly which is like vector matrix multiplication, which is decomposed by element by element multi multiply and accumulate. Then we have a number of nonlinear operations such as rectified linear unit, softmax, right, the sigmoid or hyperbolic tan. So a convolution operation which, which constitutes the majority of all the computations in deep learning networks, right, is nothing but an array, like you're projecting your input image to a stencil or what to call a kernel, right? And you do a, a element-wise multiply and accumulate. So you multiply this one with that element and then you add the nine elements together to get the output. So imagine that like now an AI hardware or an AI application will constitute like millions and millions of these operations, but the building block is fairly simple in this case, but then, so if you can build the hardware, you need to take this operation and scale it up. Now, the issue is that now is that the models are increasing in size so much, right? That actually you're having 
the uh, size of application can go in like megabytes or even gigabytes in this case. So models can, can be very huge in size and can exceed your system requirements and require a ton of operations. So that's becoming the challenges in designing the system from the hardware and the software perspective. You wanna make things to run efficiently. You wanna run things, run fast. And at the same time, and if you wanna do it in an embedded domain, you have to be mindful of the constrained resources that you have. So the key messages that I have in this talk, and if you don't remember anything else, right, try to remember this, that um, the dedicated hardware, right, drastically improves the accuracy of DNNs, right? And we, we have to make it tailored to how DNNs execute. You need to have a perspective from algorithms to nano devices so that you can tune all the possible knobs, right, to really achieve optimality in design and runtime. And finally, the new computing paradigms and new emerging devices can give you mean, new breakthroughs and overcome existing bottlenecks in the conventional designs of computing systems. All right. So if we dig deeper into, so I will talk about the AI hardware design, try to show you how we can do this an end to end approach. We look at the algorithmic optimizations. And then finally, right, I'll show you some of the emerging trends. So the, um, the hardware design, right, in a very simplistic way, you have your hardware accelerator over here. Let me just get the pointer. So you have your hardware accelerator over here, which constitute what we call a PE, which I'll, I'll explain later, some memory here, and then some sort of interconnect, whether it's an in-chip, on-chip or off-chip, to large memory, which contains your weights and what we call the activations. The building block here, which is the PE, we call the processing element, right? This one is the building block of all. So it, this one does the, the, the multiply and accumulate. It takes the activations, it takes the weights, and then it produces the outputs in this case. So any hardware design will include just a large number of this connected differently and some controller to orchestrate the data flow movement in this case. Now, there've been a massive amount of hardware, as, can, as I showed before, right? I'm just gonna give you here some examples. Some of the hardware actually uses the direct implementation of convolution. So here, for example, you have your Mac or the processing element, right? Have some control here. And here's like some scratch pad memory. Right, connected to some global memory, and then the the from the DRAM you get uh, some buffering mechanism to send the output weights and activation. So it's all about the design of this part over here. This is the Iris uh, MIT uh, chip, and this is the Diana right chip that's done by Cambricon, which is a, a company AI company already found in China. Another way of realizing the hardware is actually making use of the fact that a convolution could be transformed into a, a matrix matrix multiplication. And then once you do that, you can actually use some of the conventional arithmetic blocks, right, in performing this computation. Take, for example, um, the Google TPU. The Google TPU, right, uses a systolic array, right, that fetches the weights and activation, right, by using this kind of like unfolding of convolution into a matrix matrix multiplication. Uh, the Da Vinci also is another one that's been uh, generated in this case. And finally, the new Tesla uh, hardware accelerator also relies on the fact of the using the general matrix uh, approach to perform this kind of computation through having one small tie here and then like scaling it up into millions of these devices. But then let me remind you this once one more time that AI hardware is not just the six, this that I showed, actually, a it's actually a big family, it's a massive range. So if I'm the new kid in the block, right? I want to design my own hardware. I'm having a huge competition. I want to show my advantage. The, or more importantly, if I'm an AI system designer, right? And I have a certain application, I want to make sure that I select the right hardware for me if I want to deploy it at large scale. So the problem is that now is that you have algorithms on one side that keeps changing and keeps getting updated. And then the hardware, if you want to design, right, if you use the conventional mechanism, right, or the conventional way, it actually, it takes a lot of time. So if you want to actually to overcome or to address this gap between the ever evolving software designs, and you want to make very quick hardware development or catch up with what's latest there, you need to find an agile hardware development infrastructure for this. So this, as I told you before, what would be the most efficient hardware design in this case? So you want to ensure optimality in terms of like uh, energy, area, cost, and so on. 
So you need to do some sort of like modeling and simulation to explore the different hardware choices, which is what we call the um, hardware software co-design, right? So when we do modeling hardware, you need to do model the hardware type, you analyze the hardware, you design it, you validate it, and then they get the key info of the hardware in this case. So we can have like a, you can look at the different architecture templates, the different data flow mapping techniques, what kind of like computing array organization in this case, what will be the, si the size of the buffers, how they are allocated, what kind of memory do you have? Is it on chip, is it off chip, is it DRAM, is it RAM, if it's MRAM, right? And what kind of interconnect? Are you using like conventional interconnect? Are you gonna go for interposer? Are you gonna go for stacking? Are you gonna go for monolithic 3D? Are you gonna do for a mix of them? So all of these like mean points that you need to have some way of modeling. It. So the typical framework of doing what we call the hardware software co-design and simulation, you would have on one side, your model hardware configurations, right? Based on the architecture parameters that I mentioned earlier, then you have the AI, the algorithm AI representation, convolution, recurrent long short-term memory. And then you have your simulator, right? That takes these inputs and gives you the performance energy and metrics in this case. So the way to do this, the, the yesterday's method of doing that, like we're using what you call the cycle accurate modeling infrastructure. And this is actually could be very slow, right? But it's the most accurate, but one run could take hours in this case. We can use actually um, in machine learning, right? To actually accelerate this. And finally, you can come actually with the ultimate speed with analytical modeling as I will show you. So a cycle accurate simulation, right? We'll take the algorithms and then present the output, the hardware estimates, right? The, one of them example called Aladdin, a single run of a single layer of the convolution neural network would take minutes or even hours to run just one run over there, all right? So imagine if that you wanna just like explore 10 different hardware architectures or like 10 different configuration of a single hardware design, that's already 10 hours. So if you have a million of them, right? We're talking about now years to come up with the right decision. So that's actually not, a good way to do so. You can actually accelerate that to make it dedicated to a specific hardware design in this case, which is another hardware simulator that can be seen here. And this will take like a couple of minutes to run things. So still faster, but not fast enough because if you take a couple of minutes or even 10 minutes, sometimes it can take one hour to run one full neural network, then to perform the entire exploration will also take you weeks or even years, right? To come up with a good confidence on the optimality of a certain design. So what, what we have done in my group, right? We try to take two approaches. We try to see, can AI, right, as a field help us in doing so? So what we have done here, we call the East DNN, right? We basically, we take a certain architecture simulator and then we train, or like we develop an AI model that like it trains what's happening here. How do you actually optimize or how do you create the same way by trying much faster than this. So this one, right, it actually um, have a very high accuracy, right? It can be actually like I mean, 2X over uh, machine learning based approaches, but the most important part, it, it achieves a million times faster, right? So if something takes an hour, you can now take some mere milliseconds in this range using this kind of like evaluation using deep learning in this case. So now we're starting to, going from hours of a single configuration to milliseconds or even seconds, right? That could help us ex do a very thorough design space exploration and try to explore all the possible technology, data flow mapping and architectural options. But we did not just like I me mean, stop there. What we wanted to actually the ultimate speed is to have a closed form representation, a set of math simple clean mathematical equations that can describe what happens in a deep learning hardware design that will help us get the utilization, memory access, execution time, energy consumption, and the area. So in my group, right, we have developed I mean, a tool called Perl, right, simulation. It's a Python based that relies on the closed form representation of execution time, energy consumption, given the algorithm representation, right, on the hardware configuration parameters in this case. So it is actually nothing, but it's just like a really set of equations, as you can see over here, to, to give you the time and the energy. And we have this paper accepted in ESP DAC this year. Um, and I'm more than happy to share the details, but I mean, I'm trying just to give an overview uh, over here so that people can understand where we're going. So when we have done this, right, we have actually achieved very, very, very like mean 
small error compared to the cycle accurate one. So the cycle accurate, if we say that's the highest accuracy, we are less than 2% error. So that's decent enough, but we're achieving more than million times speed up. So if you think about scale sim could take minutes, Perl achieves the same result with less than 2% in microsecond range, right? Microsecond for a single run. Now you can do millions, right? Of these different, try to play with all the possible control knobs and get your needed within hours, you perform this kind of million point design and then you can achieve optimality. Not just that, but since we have achieved equations, right, a closed form representation, that unlocks the possibility to perform mathematical optimizations and provide a mathematical guarantee on optimality in this case. So we can use this model, right, in our system exploration and optimization. So let's take an example here. If I'm having an off-chip memory with a certain interconnect and an accelerator with a certain data flow mapping scheme, the question is that now, if a certain area, how can we split between the amount of on-chip memory and the compute unit, right, to achieve the best configuration? So you give an earlier constraint, right? You find the accelerator, you try to mean, analyze the area between the number of compute units and the on-chip memory. And then you explore that, right? And in this case, we'd explore it using 28 nanometer, assuming it's an edge application scenario, right? And then we try to accelerate with the, up, with the optimal energy delay product, which is actually the measure of energy efficiency. Now, what was interesting to us, right? In this case, we actually took two possible cases. One is the MIT IRIS configuration, and one is the Google TPU. And what we have found is that with different, like, I mean, uh, convolution neural network configuration, there is different bounds, right, that you can see here. But the interesting part is that we did not I mean the sizes or the amount of the configuration that was actually used in the um, in the system, right, that's been fabricated is not actually the optimal one, right? That actually we, you can actually do better and you can achieve a better energy efficiency by redesigning the infrastructure over there. All right, so that was like, I mean, just like an overview, how can we optimize the design? But we said before that the DNN models are actually huge, right? They're computing intensive and also memory intensive in this case. So for memory intensity, right? You wanna be able to reduce the memory operations. One, you wanna be able to reduce the traffic going from off-chip to on-chip memory, right? By either increasing the on-chip capacity or improving the connectivity between the computer and memory operations. Secondly, or the more importantly, you want to be able to use right a reduced memory footprint, right? You want to reduce the amount of memory you need in this case, right? So that when you design your system, you don't have to go with gigabytes, but you can go with megabytes of memory store. So to reduce the memory footprint, right? We can go the first, the most important thing, like, or the first direct thing is basically you can remove right the unneeded computations that does not affect the accuracy in this case. All right. So in this case, right, you will be able to, from before pruning to after pruning, you would have reduced connections, which means that now your memory requirement to store the weights will be reduced in size. You can also go for quantization, right? Which basically, instead of using 32 bits per, per one variable, you can reduce it down and you can go all the way to like two bits or a single bit representation in this case. So, one last thing is that you can now, once you have done that, you can use also entropy coding or some sort of coding to even compress the weights even further and really achieve the best uh, compression techniques in like storing your weights in, in, especially in edge systems. So what we have done in this case, we actually explored different coding mechanisms and we relied on the use of the tungsten coding to store the weights. We have used that to compress the weights and build also hardware de dedicated decompressor right, of the thumbstyle decoder for the weights. And with this way, we have managed to achieve, right, with up to 20 times reduction of the memory weights that you need in this case. So if it originally uses like, I mean, the resonant 50, 102 megabytes, right, with 32 bits, we can get it into just five megabytes, right, with, uh, with, with an average of 1.6 bits per weight, right? And all of that while achieving, right, roughly the same accuracy. There is not much change, right? From this is the top one, 75.5, we're getting it to 75.1. So we can actually really achieve 
high compression, but still retaining the accuracy of the neural network classification. So this would allow us to take this, and instead of going for platforms 102 megabytes, which would be your mobile phone, to something like a five megabyte, which could be now your smartwatch or even smart glasses. So we also developed the hardware and then we ran it to uh, <coughs> hardware simulations, right? When we can achieve actually higher speed up than the Huffman coding with less that and that achieve overall system speed up. So we try to do this right now, we can use actually a system with non-volatile memory. So now we take this component and when you converge it with system with non-volatile memory, right? We have managed to develop a system, right? That uses MRAM as an on-chip memory to be able to run AI at the edge in this case. This is we're using the 22 nanometer with TSMC MRAM. So we had like two, two megabytes of capacity. We run the whole system at 15 milliwatts. And we were happy to have fabricated the chip, packaged it, and even developed the prototyping board. And when we test it, right, this is what we call the ECS1 or the Emerging Computing System 1, right? We have very, very, very low power. And that is enabled by the non volatile memory because now it's, everything is on chip. As I mean, also stated by, uh, my, by the previous speaker, MRAM is very efficient. You can turn things very quickly. It has very high speed read, right? So we can do that, right? In the applications, we'll be running faster than you can turn off the entire system and let the whole system go to sleep. But now we have the entire ecosystem combine that with the software optimizations as well. We also looked into how can we improve the connectivity. And in this case, I will show an example when using the monolithic 3D, right? Which is the nano engineer uh, computing system technology, which we call Next, right? It's done in, in my group in collaboration with Stanford, right? We overcome the uh, connectivity wall, we, uh, the memory wall, the computing wall, and we can achieve a thousand times improvement in energy efficiency, right? Uh, over existing systems. Um, I invite people to read this paper. I mean, it's a really elaborate paper. We, we tested this with more than 100 workloads and even we have experimental prototypes to really showcase the ability of monolithic 3d systems so so with this now we can show that like i mean the overall system design right and I mean the algorithmic optimization that could help us really recompress things but how can you take things to the next level right is overcoming the main problem is that this like really sophisticated hierarchy right from going from the compute to the memory uh in this case right this is like a lot of memory operations so if you can bring the compute very close to the memory, right? Either not just like not by that, not by near memory computing, but in memory computing, where you can use the computing operations uh, inside the memory, that will be able to achieve high, extremely high um, performance uh, and energy efficiency in this case. So there's a lot of work, right? I, mean, I, I don't I mean I don't think that I can like uh, I will give it enough time, but there's been a, a ton of work. The use of like I mean, RAM and MRAM as in-memory block components and many places are trying to get that done. The most challenge that people have right now is the compatibility with the digital domain scalability to large models and having the right software support to perform that. So there's been a lot of work on the use of AI accelerators based on near memory and in-memory computing system. I just wanted to highlight some would apply that at existing uh, memory technologies like DIMM, right? Um, or we can have like many specific accelerator on the architecture design that can use RAM in this case, either or with SRAM. So um, I think I'm a little bit early, but to conclude, right, to be able to design the next generation of AI hardware system, you cannot just look at one aspect of it, right? You cannot just look at the devices. Every piece of the puzzle, right, will help you achieve a massive improvements in this case. So you need to look at the system integration. You need to look at the algorithms. How can you apply, uh, remove the unnecessary computations and weights? Uh, you need to look at the architecture design. How would you analyze things and perform design space exploration very, very quickly? You need to uh, leverage all the possible devices and nanotechnology integration techniques. Of course, I mean, this is not just my work, right? I'm just like, um, I have to thank these heroes, right? Who've been like doing all the heavy lifting. I'm just like me enjoying giving a talk on their behalf. But I can't thank, thank them enough. I mean, they're really, really hardworking students. Uh, if they're here attending, I mean, I, I thank them a lot. And I thank, I thank also thank all students who contribute in the uh, advancement of the research fields uh, worldwide. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, more than happy to take uh, questions. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, so we will take um, some questions uh, from the audience. 
say anything? So let me ask one question. Um, so in, in, in your talk, uh, so new architecture, in-memory computing chip, that's yes. obviously mm -hmm. uh, one of the key uh, modules. And that could be integrated into uh, next generation AI chips. Uh, so what, what do you, uh, uh, what is the, uh, you know, the best, uh, the most important requirements to do uh, uh, non-volatile memory chips like a STTM RAM? Uh, what would you like to, uh, what's kind of the specific, uh, I mean, uh, performance would you like to have uh, in that uh, non volatile memory in the AI chips? Right. Okay. So, so, okay. So I will talk about the use of non volatile memory. You can use it in two main, uh, main families. One is the conventional systems. Like we have just like the memory, you can store the weights in it and like try to bring it close to your compute unit. And one is trying to, to use the really in-memory computing or the neuromorphic style computing. Mm -hmm. So for the first type, right, the key point there is you need to have um, really small arrays, right? Why is that? Because when you have this memory there, you want to be able to leverage that you can read a lot of weights at the same time and perform a lot of parallel computations uh, I mean, uh, simultaneously. So that would, I mean, force you to read things in a non-uniform manner. So you, do, you need your memory not to be like one big block, but actually more of like a, a SRAM or register, a register file. Like you have 128 kilobytes SDT RAM or SOT RAM or MRAM, right? Blocks, and then you can read in parallel the weights there and the activations that you can form the computations very quickly. And you can put your compute units very close to this memory blocks. Now, if we go to the uh, like brain inspired or neuromorphic computing, right? The, the main point, right, if you want to do the training using them is endurance, right? Because right now, despite mean the, 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 M, the M, MRAM right you now that you can have in market, um, it, it doesn't have like mean a massive endurance. Like it could be 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9, but you need it to go very hard to be into to uh, enjoy a lot of writing to it. But more importantly, you need a lot of uniformity, right? Especially if you want to explore the multi-bit uh, storage capability in this case. So mm -hmm. if you want to have multi-bit per cell, right, you want to ensure that the uniformity of um, the resistances, right, is not like very, has, does not have very wide distribution. Because when you have something like that, then you will you create like a lot of gaps to distinguish between the stored values. And the bigger the distribution it is, or the bigger the variation it is, right, the harder it is to distinguish between storing one, two, or three then what you will have to be forced to do is actually limit the precision in this case. Mm -hmm. Now, you would then need to incorporate that at the algorithm level to tell them, okay, I'm going to build a very large array. It can only store like three bits or three values, not three bits, three values. Can we design an, 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 uh, an AI system that can only use zero, one, two, mm -hmm. right? And nothing in between, nothing extra. So that will be the challenge in this case. So if you can provide uniformity at the technology perspective, that will make things a lot easier to deploy more sophisticated um, AI applications, right? At a much smaller footprint with much less energy consumption. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Uh, you can write on the chat board. Uh, uh, nothing there. Okay, uh, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank, thanks, uh, Prof. Mohammed, for the presentation. Actually, I have a question. Uh, what would you say is, uh, because in your conclusion, you showed that developing AI accelerators that encompasses the entire flow from circuits to algorithms. What, moving forward, for developing better uh, accelerators, what would you say it would be the greatest challenge from a research perspective, whether it comes from the devices, algorithms, or any other level of system architecture? Uh, okay. I think the, the greatest challenge, uh, I mean, I would say in this case is, um, is actually more of like the isolated research in each of the field, right? So, so I, I think that like, I mean, in terms of like time-wise, uh, devices would be the slowest and algorithms would be the fastest and everything would be just like somewhere in between. But if the device, if the device researchers do not know what are the challenges of the algorithms or the, or the algorithm folks do not really what's happening in the research, right? They will 
not be able to understand, right, what opportunities are there that they could leverage or could solve one of their existing challenges in this case, right? I'll give you, I'll give you a clear example, right? One thing, like, let's say, I mean, um, our RAM, right, has a limited ride endurance, right? I mean, if the algorithm folks or like if the algorithm folks know this, right, they could design something that can like reduce the writing ability or the architecture folks would design something that reduces the right abilities, right? And then the researchers that the RM may lift, may have less burden than instead of like trying to go to 10 to the 15 endurance, they can say, you know what, 10 to the line seems to be good enough. And we can now have something in reality that can go there and can work. So I would say it's the communication that is the biggest challenge, right? Um, in this case, but I would say that also devices would be the, uh, like if a, a single isolated field would be the device field. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any others? Okay, uh, Mohammed, thank you very much for your talk. And thank you, my pleasure. All right, uh, okay, let's move on to uh, the next uh, talk. It's a little bit early, but okay, the next talk. Uh, will be uh, spin. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, next talk will be uh, Spintronics for HAI, a devices to algorithms. Kelvin uh, Fong, are you there? Uh, from yes, yes, yes. I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. See, I, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead. Okay. Good. Let me try to uh, share my slides. Give me a moment. Okay. Oh. Okay, is my screen uh, visible? Ah, uh, yes, it's visible. Okay, let me just move things around. Okay, so first, a very big thank you to the, uh, the organizing committee for organizing this seminar. Uh, you know, I'm uh, Calvin Fong from NUS. Uh, my research group is called the Semiconductor and Emerging Electronic Devices Exploratory Research Group. And, uh, you know, we have been doing a broad range of uh, research topics spanning devices all the way up to mapping of algorithms to uh, hardware accelerators, right? So uh, I'm, I'm glad that actually that uh, my <laughs> slot is right after uh, Muhammad in this case, because, you know, he has given a very nice overview from uh, the algorithms down to the circuits uh, hardware, right? Uh, in my talk today, I'm actually going to go from the opposite direction. So I'm going to start from the devices and work towards uh, the algorithms, right? So let's maybe just uh, have a, a recap, you know, why look at brain-inspired computing, right? In fact, if you look at AI, we have come a long way. You know, AI is something that's been around with us for quite a long time, but uh, with the emergence of uh, very good uh, computing hardware, like general purpose GPU computing, um, you know, artificial intelligence algorithms have gained a quantum leap in uh, performance. And we have seen amazing developments. You know, for example, uh, just not too long ago, uh, you know, within the past decade, we have uh, computer algorithms that have been able to challenge, uh, you know, our human champions in games like Go, chess, and even multiplayer computer games like, uh, you know, Dota, for example, right? And, you know, uh, so those demonstrations were great, but now in the past few years, you start to see that AI is moving towards applications that are beginning to have more impact on society. So for example, you know, we have uh, robo taxis that are coming very soon and basically autonomous vehicles, right? I think in Singapore, we also have a lot of uh, autonomous vehicle research that's going on to see how we can bring uh, autonomous public transportation uh, for a variety of reasons, right? To relieve manpower constraints, also for uh, alleviating some of these uh, climate change uh, energy consumption problems. Now, even more urgently, you know, with the pandemic that's going on, uh, AI has played a role as well. So, for example, uh, down here on the top right, you show, you know, Wall Street Journal has an article that said that, uh, you know, Pfizer, who has been rolling out the vaccines, they have been using AI uh, to help in monitoring uh, the clinical trials, right? And basically, you look at statistics and you figure out uh, the important numbers they will need to know in order for you to be able to more rapidly deploy the vaccine to the public. Now, all these things actually require uh, AI 
to be able to have the compute and the memory requirements. So let's take a look at some of the key demands of the AI system. So on the top left over here is a chart that talks about uh, you know, the computing power required for different AI models. And this was data that's uh, published by OpenAI and uh, shown in the, the Economist uh, not too long ago. So down here you can see that uh, if you have uh, one petaflop per second kind of computing power, then what are the different kinds of uh, time frames that different AI models can give you a result in, right? So for example, if you look at some of the more uh, simple uh, algorithms, like for example, down here, you're talking about LXNet, looking at image classification uh, on deep neural networks, uh, for example. Uh, it takes about, you know, on the order of uh, three hours in order for you to train a network and then do image classification. But if you want to go towards you know, very, very sophisticated kind of uh, operations and capabilities, such as uh, you know, AlphaGo Zero, as shown here. You know, AlphaGo Zero is actually one of the uh, algorithms that uh, was toppled the world champion uh, playing uh, Go, right? And uh, you know, what you see over here is that even with one petaflop per second kind of computation power, it would still take roughly about you know, three months or so in order for the algorithm to be able to teach itself how to play Go and beat the world champion. So, you know, that sort of reinforces what the Muhammad talked about earlier on about the computing power required for the, all these uh, AI algorithms. Now, on the right, we show basically data coming from uh, MCU Net in MIT that talks more about the, the memory consumption requirements, right? So today, if you look at, for example, things like ResNet, which do, does uh, image classification on the cloud, uh, you know, the memory requirements are, are insanely huge. You know, for example, you talk about just the activations alone, it could require about 16 gigabytes of memory, right? And storage of the weights, for example, would go to terabytes to petabytes worth of memory. But if you really want to actually have ubiquitous AI, that means you have these algorithms being deployed in mobile systems everywhere and being able to make a more impact at the personal level, then you sort of need to cast your, your algorithm down to something that is more hardware amenable for things like mobile devices. And, you know, MCU Net, for example, showed that even for mobile net, for example, uh, the memory requirement for activation could go down to as huge as you know, four gigabytes still. And even for the weights, you're not getting you know, much improvements. You're still on the order of you know, 566, uh, 556 gigabytes or so. So the total amount of memory that you need, even with pruning, you know, where Mohammed talked a little bit about network pruning, you see over here, this mobile net V2, basically you reduce the precision, for example, of the uh, computations. The amount of memory that you need uh, to store these models and, and to operate is still very, very huge. You know? And things actually get worse if you start looking at certain applications and what are the kinds of uh, applications I'm uh, talking about. So, oops, I think down here, the slide is not coming up properly. But down here, basically, uh, Okay, let me just pause a bit to make sure that this slide comes up. Uh... The slides are out. Yes, let me uh, share it again. I just edited a slide. Yep. Okay, I apologize for that. Yeah, so down here, we, we see an, an example application, right? So we have autonomous vehicle. And uh, I think this was data that was released by Lucid Motos, I think in the past uh, one year or so. And basically, if you look at an application such as autonomous vehicles, you know, these are applications where you have a huge amount of sensors that generate sensory data for the system to make actionable decisions, right? You have actionable data that allows it to make decisions such as, you know, when to stop, whether to speed up, change lanes, etc. So down here, you can see a variety of different sensors on, on the car, like a radar, there's LiDAR, uh, camera sensors, ultrasonic sensors, and other kinds of sensors, right? And basically, if you look at the number of sensors, the number of uh, the amount of data generated, 
you know, the bandwidth of data generation is you know unprecedented. You're talking about you know on the order on the low end you have 1.4 terabytes per hour of data, all the way up to as high as 19 terabytes per hour of data. So not only is the computational requirements of AI models huge, the memory requirement, you know, the amount of data that your, your system has to manage and process is also unprecedented, right? It's, it's, it's insanely huge. So therefore, you know, we have to architect the system. And when I talk about system, we're not talking just about algorithms. We're not talking just about the system architecture. We talk about everything, you know, devices all the way up to the algorithms. You need to architect them in a way that can help you perform the compute with the right throughput and manage the data uh, at the same time. So today, where are we? Now today, if you look at a lot of AI systems, we're actually computing in the cloud. So in this approach, the idea is that data is collected by uh, devices locally, right? So you have different input data going to your processor, for example, and then what the processor does is it offloads the data over to the cloud. The cloud does the heavy lifting with the computations for neural networks and stuff like that, generates the output data and then sends actionable data back to your processing element. And then it could you know, do whatever it needs to do, right? From an intelligence point of view. But if you were to you know, take this approach and look at things like autonomous uh, cars, uh, we have a lot of different challenges, right? So one of the most significant challenges that we need to overcome is, for example, energy consumption of data transmission. You know, because uh, wireless transmission of data is actually fairly, fairly uh, energy consuming, right? It could be you know, as high as the compute power that you have or even much higher than that. Now, you also make yourself, uh, open yourself uh, prone to security issues because now if you're transmitting data over the network, the actionable uh, data needs to be transmitted back to your local devices. Hackers could actually intercept such communications and then cause havoc in your entire network, right? So you don't want that to happen. So another uh, big problem is that you have certain end-to-end -end latency requirements uh, for some of your applications. You know, for example, in autonomous cars, you do need to process the input data and have actionable data and action within a few hundred microseconds to milliseconds because uh, you know, being late to have these kind of data could mean life or death to the occupants in the vehicle, right? So as a result, you know, there's a lot of ongoing work looking at this new approach called the Edge AI, all right? So if you look at Edge AI, what's the idea? Well, the idea is, you know, as what uh, Muhammad has sort of alluded to is that we want to start moving certain computations towards Edge devices, right? So uh, wh why do we want to do that? Well, one way is you, you want to alleviate this problem of security, right? Another big advantage that you gain out of doing that is now because you don't need to offload data over to the cloud for processing, uh, you can do certain uh, important tasks such as uh, inference. If you look at uh, the, the figure on the bottom, you see the main difference between the two models is that inference is no longer done in the cloud. Inference is actually done on your edge devices. Now, by doing inference on the edge devices, what that allows you to do is to actually reduce your latency, your end-to-end -end latency. And then that means you could uh, have much better systems that give you uh, certain guarantees in, in terms of the safety, in terms of actionable data, etc. And if you look at, for example, uh, the market, uh, you know, the edge AI is definitely taking off, right? It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a big thing right now. And of course, when we start talking about edge AI, there are a lot of opportunities available, right? I think uh, one of the questions asked earlier on was to ask about, you know, are we talking about circuits and systems? or even algorithms, right? So definitely, if you look at the industry, there are a lot of work looking at uh, specialized uh, systems. Uh, for example, PowerVR over here has published some data uh, comparing their solutions for uh, Edge AI. And uh, you, know, you see that if you optimize the electronics and, and the subsystem, you could get significant uh, amounts of benefit as compared to just using your CPUs for your compute. Now, I want to start going into the kinds of uh, research that I'm actually doing in my group in terms of going from the devices to the algorithms. Now, in order to do that, what we need to first understand is what is the main premise of doing these uh, brain-inspired computing? Now, the main premise is that 
in order to achieve the kinds of energy efficiencies that you see in a lot of these uh, AI algorithms, we take inspiration from what we know best about intelligent systems, and that is the biological brain. And what we do is we want to build uh, systems and networks of artificial neurons that emulate the behavior and connections of neurons in biological brains, hopefully to be able to achieve the kinds of uh, computational power as well as the energy efficiency of the biological brain, right? So the figure over here basically shows you what the cell body of a biological neuron kind of looks like, right? You have the, the neuron over here, and basically you see that it has a few distinct components, right? You have the cell body, you have the axon, you have the, the uh, synapse, and then the synapse itself is connected to the dendrites of the next uh, neuron. So if we were to look at uh, these components of the biological neuron, you can approximately abstract out certain uh, fu mathematical functionalities that is going on in these uh, systems, right? Basically, you have your transmitting neuron, your uh, nucleus is over here, and that sends a spike signal after it does certain kinds of computation and thresholding. This spike signal would be modulated by synapses of the receiving neuron, and then the receiving neuron takes all these modulated signals, sums it up together, performs some kinds of thresholding, and then it fires a spike if it exceeds the threshold, and that spike uh, is transmitted to the next neuron, for example. So if you were to take this model and abstract out the mathematical formulation, uh, you know, people have found that this output spike would have this mathematical expression over here. You, you pass basically the weighted summation of your inputs uh, together with a bias, and then compare that to some thresholding function, which could be an activation function such as a sigmoid function, for example. And then the result of that, if it uh, exceeds a certain number, uh, if you have a hard threshold, for example, then that would uh, emit a spike at that neuron. Now, consequently, what this means is that you can actually use certain uh, hardware primitives, right, device level hardware primitives to emulate some of these computations. So for example, in one of the earlier research that I've done, we have looked at using uh, deep current sources as uh, the, the voltage outputs uh, to current input conversion. Uh, basically, you have a, a set of uh, uh, spintronic devices over here uh, using this non-local spin talk uh, phenomenon uh, to actually switch uh, MTJ. And then you use that MTJ to determine whether to send a signal or not to the next uh, neuron, for example. Now, another uh, possible uh, primitive is this uh, analog dot product uh, crossbar. Right, so you heard uh, Mohammed talk a lot about uh, doing uh, this in-memory compute, for example. So one of the approach, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, is using these uh, crossbar arrays to perform analog in-memory compute. And then ba basically you have a large amount of parallelism uh, doing uh, vector uh, matrix multiplication using such uh, analog approaches. And you can also significantly get uh, better uh, energy efficiencies. And then of course, if you look at uh, devices like spintronic devices, you do have things like critical voltages or critical currents to switch a device. And you can actually leverage that uh, as the thresholding function for your activation functions in the uh, neuron. Now, if you were to really take one step further, right? We're, we're, although we're talking about edge AI, uh, there are actually a lot more other computing models that are uh, becoming quite uh, interesting. But if you look at all these different kinds of uh, computational approaches, there are certain things that are common about them. So the two main uh, thrusts that are common is that if the first thing is most of these approaches are going to be very, very memory intensive, right? And therefore, if you go from a, a architect, system architect, or circuit architect uh, point of view, then you want to develop your architectures in a very memory-centric way. So the idea is that you, because memories are something that has been around with us for a very long time, the architecture, the structures, operations, and stuff like that are, are very, very uh, well studied and uh, well known. So you want to preserve the memory structure and the operation, but you only modify the peripheral circuitry to enable computations and thereby reduce the data movement uh, to enable energy efficiency. So there are different uh, approaches in this uh, umbrella. So one is the, the analog matrix vector multiplier that I talked about and Muhammad talked about earlier on. 
uh, if we are talking about things like spiking neural networks, for example, these are uh, systems where you need a lot of uh, routing of signals through the entire network in order for compute to happen. So you need things potentially like content addressable memories. And uh, to, to a large extent, you might even need certain uh, very specialized uh, uh, architectures like Embit that's proposed by uh, Ono Mutlu, right? Who is now, I think, at uh, EPFL in uh, Switzerland uh, using DRAM, right? Now, on the other hand, you could also build very application-specific kind of architectures. So application-specific architectures would be things like you know, neuromorphic processors like Loihi. Uh, you could get all these uh, quantum processors uh, that you know, IBM, Google are looking at, and even things like simulated annealers uh, that several companies, uh, Hitachi and uh, D-Wave Computing, for example, have been looking at. But in these application-specific uh, designs, the idea is that now we actually need to jointly optimize the devices, hardware, as well as the software uh, to target operations specific to the algorithm. And the reason we want to do this is, of course, we have certain uh, benefits that we can get in these algorithms. Uh, at the algorithm level, it, it is known that these are able to solve certain problems that existing computers have trouble solving and cannot give you the best result, for examples. But in this approach, the key idea is you would want to uh, you know, leverage emerging device technologies because they have certain novel physics, right? Certain novel behavior and uh, electrical characteristics that provide a better match between what you have uh, in the device physics as well as the algorithm. And because of that better match, you can potentially build much more energy efficient accelerators for these different kinds of applications. And I'll talk about some of these things uh, as I progress uh, in today's talk. Now, the first thing I would like to talk about is, uh, you know, memory, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, memory centric is going to be a big thing. And uh, as Muhammad talked about in a lot of his uh, talk, you know, really looking at memories, right? Non-volatile memories, for example. And, you know, in my uh, earlier work, you know, we did look at uh, STT MRAM, for example. And we do know that STT MRAM is good for a lot of emerging compute because of certain advantages. Now, it has potential for things like high density because you have a very, very small footprint for the bit cell. Uh, these are non-volatile memories, so you potentially can get near zero leakage power by turning off uh, segments of the memory that is not being used at all, right? Uh, you can potentially get very high speed with uh, uh, MRAM, right? I think a uh, very recent demonstration of uh, SOT MRAM has showed that you can do switching uh, in the, I think, uh, hundreds of picosecond uh, range, right? So you do get very, very uh, good speed. And compared to a lot of your other competing uh, embedded non-volatile memory technologies, uh, MRAM has the advantage of being very high endurance, right? And that's something that's known. You can hit, I think, on the order of 10 to the 15 writes, right, uh, cycles before uh, the device breaks down. Now, there is a need to conduct uh, research across the traditional layers of design hierarchy, right? So it's not just about the devices, it's not just about you know, looking at MTJs, you actually need to look at a lot more things. There's joint optimization needed of the material stacks, the device architecture, the circuits, microarchitectures, system architectures, and even software algorithms to identify certain key issues and develop novel solutions for them. Right. So one of the examples that well, I did a long time ago was to look at this one transistor, one magnetic tunnel junction, SCT MM memory cells. Uh, we were not looking at things from the uh, device level, but we were looking at things from the circuit level. And what we basically found was that at the circuit level, there are certain issues such as, uh, such as a shared read and write current paths because your magnetic tunnel junctions are two terminal devices. Uh, because of the electrical behavior, the excess transistor in the memory cell, uh, and you need bi-direction current flow in order to write the cell, you could get what is called this source degeneration problem uh, in the 1T1 MTG STTMM cell. Uh, and then, of course, because you only store data as the state in only one MTG, you have single-ended sensing, which you know means that your... Uh, sensing scheme itself could be not tolerant to process variation. And uh, if you need to have very reliable reads, you possibly need to incur a high read latency. Now, moving on, you know, these STTMR memories could be used to perform 
uh, you know, in-memory computing, for example. And in fact, uh, one approach is known as this processing in-memory array. Now, the idea over here is that you want to perform computations on data stored within the array of the memory cells and save energy by avoiding data movement. Okay, so let's take a look, for example, if you have a two kilobyte memory array, then the word line is usually turned on in order for you to read to uh, read from or write to all 128 bits of uh, memories bits in the same row, right? But for digital in-memory computations, one can re-engineer the peripheral circuitry to turn on two rows of memory and perform bitwise end operations, for example, on the data stored in the cells along the same column, but in different rows. So the data stored in this cell over here on my pointer is pointing at would be ended with the bit stored at this uh, location in the memory, right? So you get uh, uh, two by 128 uh, bits accessed at one time, and you get 128 uh, and operations that uh, happen at the same time. So very, very highly parallel operations. Now, if you really want to take things to the extreme, one can do what is called the in-memory computing uh, using an analog fashion, right? And the idea over here is that you can make use of uh, circuit laws in order to enable these analog computations. So down here, what we show is that four rows of your memory are actually selected, and then you input uh, voltages. So your voltage uh, vector would be the, the vector uh, component of your operation that you want to act on. The data that is stored in your memory array would be the entries of your matrix. So what happens is once you give the voltages to the lines, then you can read out the current along each column in your array. And these currents would basically give you the result of your matrix vector multiplication. Now, of course, there is a cost associated with uh, building these kinds of uh, approaches for in-memory computing, right? So the biggest cost, of course, is the complexity of the peripheral circuitry. Now, if you were to consider the analog computation, for example, you actually need a lot of analog to digital converters in order to obtain the vector result. Now, if you can actually get rid of those ADCs, then you get actually much better uh, cost effectiveness as well as energy efficiencies for your analog computations. And some research groups have been actively uh, researching on these designs that are called ADC-less uh, uh, in in memory, analog in-memory computing uh, designs. Right? Now, there are also issues when it comes to the algorithm. So for example, one of my uh, students have looked at earlier on is that in order for you to have zero errors when you do these analog computations, there is a requirement on the off and on currents of the memory cells. And basically we have an inequality over here that sort of uh, gives you the relationship between the off current and the on current. And in this uh, inequality, this N over here is basically the number of rows that you are turning on to do the computation. And then this epsilon over here is basically your error due to the sensing, right? So for example, if you have ADC, you have certain uh, sensing errors that you have you can tolerate. You need to make sure that your currents are, have certain uh, noise margins in order for the output of the ADC to be correct, right? So basically, you, you're at a device level, you have to ensure that such a inequality is fulfilled in order for your analog in-memory computing uh, hardware or array to perform the computation with zero errors. So this is one example where you know device level uh, implications do impact your uh, algorithm level uh, behavior. Now another approach to do uh, in-memory computing is this uh, processing in memory periphery approach, right? So the idea over here is that if you were to look at larger memory arrays, these memory arrays are usually formed using smaller sub arrays, like those that I showed in the previous slide. And these sub arrays are taught together in a fashion like this to build your larger memory, right? And why is this done in uh, electronics? Well, this is actually done mainly to optimize the delays for memory accesses in your traditional memory system. Now, existing systems using this design would, for example, read operands out of memory. So for example, you have two different operands in your memory. 
you might need to read it out to the processor, for example. Your processor would do the computation, generates the result, and then write it back into the memory array. So what this means is that from the system level behavior uh, point of view, you actually need to move data out of your memory array into the processor that does the compute and then move the, the result back into the memory array. So can we do better? Well, the processing in computing, a processing in memory periphery approach uh, basically changes the way the peripheral circuitry is designed and builds this uh, network on chip kind of architecture where you can potentially take the operands from different sub arrays, send it through the network over to the target uh, sub array where the result is gonna be stored. And then that sub array itself performs the computation and then writes the result into the uh, array itself. Now, this approach is definitely uh, much more applicable to systems where your AI model is fairly large. You need a lot of uh, memory to store the AI model as, as well as the data that needs to be processed. And then that results in your operands that need to be stored physically in different parts of your memory, right? And then your result might need to be written to another uh, physical subarray that is different from all your operands. So such, an, such a design would be suitable for that. But of course, these techniques have a, a big uh, challenge in the sense that, yes, we can design the hardware to do it. We can design the peripheral circuitry to do it. We know what are the constraints, specifications, etc. But you need to expose all these hardware operations to the operating system so that these uh, hardware operations are exposed to the software, which are your AI algorithms. And then they can make use of these hardware operations to accelerate their own computations. Now, a, a slightly different uh, thrust that I want to uh, talk about, focusing still on memories, is that if you look at uh, STTMRM, for example, there are certain unique characteristics of the memory array that you can use to embed certain functionality. So one uh, functionality that I show over here is this read-only memories. So basically what we do is we take our conventional memory array and down here, what I show is that if you have one column of your memory cells, you can potentially embed one additional line in the column. And by selectively connecting each of the memory cell to the different column and then re-engineering the peripheral circuitry, you can actually embed read-only memory uh, data into your random access memory. So why do we want to do this? Well, we can do this to enable hardware acceleration for different kinds of uh, algorithms. You know, for example, you have certain signal processing algorithms. You want to evaluate transcendental functions like cosine functions, uh, sine functions. So what you can do using these read-only memories is to store lookup tables. And you use these lookup tables in your algorithm to perform certain computations uh, that gives you the final result. You can also do other things like built-in self-tests. You can do things like uh, decoder tables. And uh, you know, for things like your AI algorithms, things become quite interesting because if you look at your activation functions, for example, a lot of your ac uh, activation functions are actually transcendental math functions. So what this means is that you can potentially make use of these read-only uh, memory design techniques uh, and embedding the read-only memory inside the random access memory so that you can use this read-only memory locally inside the memory array to perform your activation itself. We don't have to move the result out of the processor in order to do the compute. And you can also get certain acceleration uh, of your uh, computation. So now that I've covered the, the memory aspect, I want to start moving towards the more application specific aspect. And uh, in order to start going towards there, the, the key things I think uh, we need to discuss a little bit about is to first understand uh, the key spintronic phenomenon that we could exploit at device level uh, to, to enable such computations, right? So generally, if I uh, survey 
some of the interesting spectronic phenomena that's available. We have things like the jamming to resistive effect. You have things like spin transfer torque, spin orbit torque, uh, the VCME effect. You could have uh, electric control of electrical polarization coupled to spin so that, uh, in things like uh, multiferroics. Uh, you could have spin momentum locking in topological insulators. And I think more recently, you know, there's a large interest looking at uh, magnetic computations. You're using spin waves, for example, to do computations. But if you look at uh, all this device physics that's out there, what you really want to be able to do from a device level point of view is to come up with a set of fundamental spintronic building blocks. So the basic idea is, you know, you can come up with different ways of uh, components of your uh, computational fabric. And fundamentally, for example, in your spintronic uh, hardware, you have these four things. You know, the first thing you have is the spin current generation. So uh, you need to be able to take your electrical stimulus, be it voltage or current, and then generate spin currents out of this. And after you generate the spin current, these, these spins current needs to be transported uh, to a, a nanomagnet, for example, to do computation. And there are many ways you can do this, right? You can use spin transfer torque, uh, you can use a spin drift diffusion, uh, you can use spin orbit torque, and uh, you can even use a magnetic transport. Now thereafter, you once this torque is exerted on a nanomagnet uh, for computation, then you need to simulate the behavior of the nanomagnet using mag magnetization dynamics. Uh, this could be using things like uh, the landau lifshitz gilbert slonczewski equation. Uh, if you have uh, antiferromagnets and ferrimagnets, for example, then you might need to use the landau lifshitz block approach. But the idea is you now need to modify your standard uh, equations to incorporate the effect of spin torque uh, inside the model. So then you can analyze what happens to the magnet in your computation. And you potentially might need to understand the device physics and the physics of the magnetic domains inside your nanomagnet to see what's the reliability of your computing approach at the device level. And then finally, you have to make use of magneto resistance. And magneto resistance is nothing but to convert the spin domain information back to the electrical domain, right? And then you might need to develop circuit models. And I think this is something that uh, we have done a lot of work in looking at MTJs, for example, which is a very good device for converting uh, spin information back to the uh, voltage domain or current domain. Now, other than looking at just conventional switching, okay, you can potentially use spin devices as spin torque nano oscillators. And uh, what we have over here is that you, you can potentially have these uh, spin torque nano oscillators to perform uh, computation, right? So down here, we show that you can use coupled spin torque oscillators, give it an image, for example, and then use injection locking and uh, uh, stuff like that, and let it do edge detection, right? So this uh, skim, uh, simulation over here is a work that I uh, did with my collaborators back in Purdue, uh, looking at uh, using spin torque oscillators to do an edge detection unit. So down here we show that, okay, I have configured the connections of the spin torque oscillators. Now the spin torque oscillators have learned how to recognize uh, the uh, uh, edges. You give the image to the spin torque oscillators, the network of spin torque oscillators, and now it would uh, align with different frequencies, it will lock with different frequencies, and each frequency will sort of correspond to a region that he has identified inside the image itself. So now you can see the different uh, regions in the image, for example. It takes about eight nanoseconds uh, for the entire uh, system to converge and, and lock. Now, another advantage of using this uh, spin torque oscillators is that the physics itself of the oscillator, the way the oscillators lock, is very similar to some known computational models such as the Ising model. So in the Ising model, basically you write this Ising Hamiltonian. It's an energy-based model, which means your Ising Hamiltonian is sort of describing the energy landscape of the system. And basically, uh, you once you configure the connections between these oscillators, it can start at some high energy uh, state. If you run your algorithm in a suitable way, then the configuration of the oscillators would slowly and gradually go to the lowest energy state or the ground state. And that gives you sort of the optimum solution for your problem, right? And the idea is that now you need to represent the cost function of an optimization problem 
in the Ising Hamiltonian, and then you let the physics solve the problem for you. And what one such algorithm that is uh, widely known is this simulated annealing uh, algorithm. Okay, so there are certain caveats at the algorithm level, right? Which means you need your formulations such that you have spins that are plus minus one okay, in order for the algorithm to work. Uh, this is not too bad because you, know, you, you have certain kinds of problems, binary decision problems that use one and zeros. So you need to encode your one and zeros into plus and minus one in order for you to use the Ising model uh, to solve your optimization problem. Now, another challenge in, these, uh, in this uh, architecture is the scalability of the hardware. Because if you were to look at uh, this approach, it actually leverages on the connections between devices. And if your matrix is very dense, it means you need a lot of connections per device. And that is something that's actually very, very difficult to achieve in actual hardware, right? If you talk about even in CMOS today, the interconnects that you have today is actually very challenging to build because you, you can't have too many connections per device. Now, another uh, interesting device physics can use in the spintronic devices is this uh, stochasticity in the uh, right uh, pro operations. So the idea is that if you look at the right operations within spintronic devices, it naturally has some kind of stochasticity due to thermal fluctuations. And you can use this stochasticity uh, to do different things. So one example that I'm showing here on the slide is you can build what are called true random number generators. And true random, uh, true random number generators are something that is uh, used in a lot of uh, hardware security applications uh, and statistical sampling, as well as Monte Carlo simulations. Now, coming to your AI hardware, for example, there are certain algorithms that make use of stochasticity. You know, you have things like uh, the PBIT that uh, you know, Professor Superior Data, as well as uh, his uh, student, uh, have, had worked on uh, using this PBIT uh, computation. Um, but basically, even if you were to do that, uh, you do have limitations in terms of the uh, uh, coupling of the devices. You can't have too much uh, device interactions. But nonetheless, you can still do certain things. And one of the works that I have done with <clears throat> one of the, my previous uh, PhD students uh, is to build uh, simulation frameworks that could better model the stochasticity at the device level so that you can generate very nice plots uh, that can show you what's the probability of switching versus different uh, voltage stimulus, uh, be it at the device level or the circuit level. And then you can actually take these results and show, okay, if I were to use this to build things like a, stochast uh, a stochastic neural network, like the restricted Boltzmann machine, how would it perform on certain tasks such as the MNIST handwritten digit recognition? Okay, so, uh, we have, you yes. have two minutes. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, this this is one. actually the second second last uh, work I'm going to present. And then I'll talk about last work and then I'll wrap up, right? Uh, so basically over here, what uh, my student did was to show that, hey, uh, there are certain uh, algorithm level uh, optimizations that you can do. And what you want to do to leverage on the devices better is to increase the sparsity of the connections. And basically that could give you uh, better errors, better energy efficiency, and also a, a faster uh, uh, latency. You know, this is very similar to the idea of doing pruning in neural networks that Muhammad talked about early on. Also very similar to reducing uh, precision of computations. Okay. Now, the last work that I'm going to talk about is something more fanciful in the sense that if we were to survey what's going on in the spintronic research, there are you know, a lot of other fanciful physics that the spintronics uh, has demonstrated. So one of these things is this magnetic computation and uh, you know, things like skirmions as well. So one of the works that uh, I have done in my group is to look at you know, how spin waves actually interact with skirmions in uh, ferromagnetic materials. And down here, what we show is that you know, if you have these uh, ferromagnet and you start inject injecting spin current locally into parts of the ferromagnet, you can actually uh, create or nucleate skirmions inside a ferromagnet device. And it turns out that these ferromagnets could actually interfere with the propagation of spin waves within the ferromagnet itself. And what my student has done is to show that, okay, if I take 
uh, my feral magnet and create a few different injection sites and come up with smart schemes for injecting spin current into these feral magnets, I could potentially build different kinds of majority gates, logic gates, etc. So one of the works that we did over here is to realize XOR gates because XOR gates are quite uh, universal for Boolean computation. Now it turns out if you use such an approach, you can actually uh, you know, take this and implement binary neural networks onto it. So we, we built this architecture called Simba. Uh, it's basically a mapping of a binary neural network. In, in fact, I think it's a VGG 16-like binary neural network onto the uh, hardware fabric itself. And then basically we show that, hey, you can actually now do these computations inside the Spintron devices. Uh, we not only use the uh, skirmionic device for the uh, uh, majority gate, we also use SOT-based uh, uh, devices for our ADCs. And then you can architect the whole thing together to perform different parts of your uh, computation, things like your convolutional network in your majority gate devices, the max pool in your uh, spin hall devices, etc. And then we basically show that if you have such a device, uh, a hardware architecture, it could possibly be fairly competitive with uh, implementations based on CPU, based on GPU, uh, FPGA, and even based on RM devices. So now I come to the conclusion of my talk. Uh, basically, you know, if we have talked about you know edge AI, right? And and basically, it is a very uh, compute and memory intensive application. And, and as uh, Muhammad talked about in his previous uh, talk, you know, I also agree that we need definitely a lot of uh, interdisciplinary research. There's a re requirement to co-optimize device materials, physics, uh, device structures, the circuits, the micro and system architectures, algorithms, and even all the way up to the, the uh, applications. Now, of course, uh, the other aspect of this is that the computing algorithms, uh, computing paradigms are going to be quite interesting. Uh, a lot of work on the memory side because these are going to be very memory intensive kind of applications. A lot of things on the application specific side, you know, be it the neuromorphic computing that a lot of people are working on, uh, on uh, things like quantum computing, uh, simulated annealing, things like that. Uh, but in each of these algorithms uh, or approaches, the key thing that we need to remember is that we can only get the best benefits, the most benefits, if we leverage the key characteristics that these technologies can give. So for example, in memory-centric computing, I talked about uh, leveraging uh, behavior of STT MRAM, SOT, even VCMA MRAM uh, to do in-memory compute. Uh, you have the digital way of in-memory compute or the analog way where you do vector matrix modification. Uh, you can even embed uh, read-only memory in the RAM, for example, in order to perform the functions of activation uh, in your uh, neural networks. Then if you really, really want to push the limits, right, then you have to go even further, looking at you know, application-specific kind of uh, uh, computing paradigms, leverage novel device physics like spin taught nano oscillators to realize things like Ising machines uh, for assimilated annealers, things like that, uh, use stochasticity in these devices for restricted Boltzmann machines or even true random number generators. Uh, and then you can even make use of, you know, magnonic uh, transport, magnonic physics uh, to build some of your neural network architectures. Great. And of course, I want to end off, uh, you know, giving thanks to the different uh, funding agencies that have contributed and funded the projects that are ongoing in my group, as well as the many uh, students past and present uh, that have contributed uh, their effort uh, to the different projects. Right. So thank you very much. And I hope I did not uh, run over. Uh, thank you very much, Kelvin. Uh, so we are, uh, sorry, we are running out of time. <laughs> Any qu uh, questions from audience? Okay, uh, so we have uh, one question here. Uh, in an edge AI based processing, is there any indication on how much power savings can be delivered by doing pre processing at the edge sensor node? Um, yes, actually, th there are quite a lot of works that have uh, shown, you know, if you use some of these in memory computing techniques. Uh, you do get orders of magnitude improvement as compared to uh, you know, the, the old way of doing things. And uh, you know, I, I think if you look at what uh, Muhammad has presented in his uh, results, for example, right, uh, you know, he has talked about 
you know, these chips working at milliwatt range, right? Fifth, I think uh, 15, 20 milliwatt range. And I think uh, there are groups looking at uh, spiking neural network uh, processes, for example, and you can push this to the order of a microwatt range, right? Possibly, right? Things are, are looking very optimistic. Uh, and if you were to compare based on uh, existing uh, chips, existing approaches, such as your mobile phones, uh, these designs based on uh, the old approach are working on, for example, roughly about uh, one watt. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are running out of time. So thank you very much, Kevin Huang. Uh, so no uh, yeah. I'd like to uh, close this session A, and we have a four-hour uh, break. In the session B, uh, we'll start in this afternoon, uh, at 3 p.m. Singapore time, 4 p.m. Japan time, uh, four hours uh, from now. Okay, uh, Professor uh, Fukuma uh, will chair the session B in this afternoon. All right, thank you very much. Hope we will see you again in this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.